welcome to The Green Pretenders, a sustainably challenged podcast. My name is Sean. And my name is Simon. And this is series two of The Green Pretenders podcast. We're back. Welcome, welcome. We've had a long break, um, but we are back in front of the microphones. And we're doing it a little bit differently this series, aren't we, Simon? Yes, we are. We are just not two Green Pretenders anymore, but each episode... We invite an honorary green pretender into our midst. Yeah, we thought maybe we'd stretch the limit of the wisdom that we can offer um, when it comes to sustainable living and the climate crisis. And we thought, what better way to treat our listeners than to bring on a guest each week who can, you know, talk about things that they love and that they do and... And open up the Green Pretender name. And bring their story to the podcast and to a broader audience. So this episode, the first of series two, our guest is Nina Georgiev, who is a writer, actor, director, producer and filmmaker based in London. Nina and I talked about sustainable filmmaking, waking up to the climate crisis and the power of storytelling. So here is our honorary Green Pretender for this episode, Nina Georgiev. Thank you so much for coming onto the podcast, Nina. Yeah, thank um, you very much for having me. So I'm going to just briefly introduce you to our listeners and or give you the chance to introduce yourself. So you're a writer, producer, actor living in London, and mm-hmm. you've recently been working on projects that have a strong environmental focus. Is that right? Yes, that is right. So do you just want to tell our listeners a bit about your journey into um, becoming climate concerned, becoming sort of environmentally focused? Yes, okay, definitely. So as you said, my kind of uh, focus within this area is largely through kind of filmmaking and storytelling. I mean, I guess like um, most of my friends and kind of peers, a couple of years ago is when I sort of properly started to wake up to the issues and you know when all the kind of strikes were going on and then Extinction Rebellion protests were going on and that's kind of when I properly sort of um, got more involved and really started reading up a lot more on the subject and it kind of immediately tied into my storytelling journey in a way Um, I think that's because um, something that I've thought about a lot and I don't know whether you find this as well as an artist is that um with these sort of huge huge issues and environmental uh conversations it's easy to feel a bit um I hesitate to say useless but like you know we could do more and achieve more if we were working in a different industry um but I hugely advocate for the arts in these sorts of conversations and I feel that as artists and creators and storytellers we actually Um, are able to say so much and reach so many people and hopefully in doing that achieve some sort of change and like change in perspective um when I went to the Extinction Rebellion protest back in I think 2019 Mm -hmm. yeah 2019 um I remember talking to one of the scientists they had like a tent up and uh he said to me and it kind of stuck with me that you know, they've been telling us all these facts for years and years and years, 30 plus years, and it's just that no one wants to hear it or no one listens, or maybe it's that people struggle to understand um, and kind of compute, you know, facts and statistics alone. And so he was kind of uh, encouraging and urging us (laughs) through this conversation to really, truly use our skill set in creating to further the discussion so that's something that I think I just feel very passionately about and that's what I'm trying my very best to do (laughs) yeah it really resonates with me what you said and I think that makes you the perfect guest for this podcast (laughs) because Sean and I are really performers first and foremost Mm -hmm. that's what we trained in that that is our passion still Mm -hmm. but we also yeah we we kind of woke up to this issue and coming from a performance background you kind of feel almost a bit useless yeah in the in the fight yeah. against climate change because you're you know you you feel like oh I, I should have maybe trained as a scientist or 
you know, or should I retrain all these kind of thoughts, but we're all in this together. We need everyone on board. Every single person on this planet Mm -hmm. needs to do their bit. And I think, yeah, we, we definitely have something to say as performers. We have a voice and maybe we also have the means. Maybe, maybe we're actually well equipped for the fight against climate change through storytelling. Yeah. So, yeah, Yeah. I think that's, Yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's the fact that we can, um, you know, reach people on an emotional level and kind mm. of ask people through characters and through story to empathize and to feel and to be moved. And I think that's where the kind of power <laughs> lies. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you grew up in Germany, is that right? Yes, I did. So I grew up in Austria and mm. I found it quite interesting when I came to the UK that there there are some differences, I think. There are some sort of differences in maybe how well the, the country as a whole is dealing with stuff like recycling and, and things like that. So yeah. did you feel a difference when you came here? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I might not have been so conscious of it when I first moved here, um, mm-hmm. but certainly in recent years and... Um, one very kind of current <laughs> example, I suppose, because it was in the news last week. I don't know if you've um, seen it kind of be spoken about again as the deposit return scheme, mm-hmm. um, which, I mean, I I don't know if you have this in Austria, I would assume so, but we've had what we know as fund. So it's like a bottle deposit return scheme for as long as I can remember where you can take your plastic bottles, your glass bottles um, and you know, recycle them properly and get uh, some money in return, essentially, yeah. for recycling it correctly. Um, and I think it was in 2018 that they first announced plans to start this in the UK. Um, but last week, they uh, announced that it wouldn't likely be enacted until 2024. Um, so that's six years after announcing that plan. And I, as something that is so Uh, kind of normal to me and I've Mm -hmm. known it for as long as I can remember it just seems like such a such an obvious and easy and like great initiative that I just don't understand why something like that isn't doesn't exist here in the same way um so that's one example that yeah um it's I think quite a big difference um Mm -hmm. and just generally in terms of recycling and you know waste uh waste removal kind of schemes like back at home we have so many more separate bins um, and kind of initiatives compared to at least the borough that I live in in London where it's really just recycling and general waste um, unless you sort of seek out um, you know tips and places to bring your 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 waste but it just feels um, it just feels a little bit more progressive on that side of things uh, back at home yeah I think so too I mean and I mean, we we want to be careful t- to say that Germany is better, you know, you, oh, I think no, no, it's difficult to compare. But that is one specific thing that I think mm. would, would make such a difference, just yeah. in perspective as well. Yeah. Because I think we need to see waste, and I'm doing quotation marks, with, mm. which is a brilliant podcasting device. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> you know, uh, waste as resources, you know, this, yeah. everything that is on this planet has a value and is useful. And yeah, I think it would change people's uh, perception massively and, and how we treat things. And, and also that we kind of just chuck our waste on the street. I, yeah. It was so alien to me when I first came mm-hmm. here. So yeah, no, completely. And the whole idea of, um, everything having a value that's I think so important to consider um it's something that I'm sure we'll get onto it but in the film that I'm working on right now that's the whole idea is that these plastics can and should be reused and you know made into something wonderful again and we've kind of talked a lot about the idea that one person's rubbish might be another person's gold and so Mm -hmm. yeah finding a way to really genuinely repurpose these materials and that's something that both an individual and kind of big brands can also be doing you know it's something across the board um that is possible so i think when it comes to 
this side of the argument or not argument this side of the kind of climate discussion I find I feel a little bit more hopeful in my own abilities because there is something that I feel I can be doing um immediately but um yeah I mean we're still miles and miles away (laughs) yeah but that's actually a brilliant transition into into talking about um small selkie Mm. Uh, do you want to tell us a bit about the did I pronounce it correctly actually yeah 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 Yeah. perfect um yeah I'll quickly summarize so small selkie is a short film about plastic pollution that I've written and I'm producing um it's basically a film about a little girl called Skye who dreams of being a mermaid and when she discovers that plastic pollution is going to threaten her future home she embarks on a quest that will teach her that creativity is truly a child's best friend Um, and on this journey she basically learns the power of yeah repurposing and revaluing and um, reusing plastics. Um, It's a fictional story but obviously strongly rooted and inspired by young people and young activists like Greta Thunberg and the Youth for Climate Action Movement all over the world and you know all the kids around the world who are doing amazing amazing things and getting really creative and using their voices um but I personally am really interested in how we can tell climate stories through fiction uh, rather than documentary both mm-hmm. super powerful mediums and I mean I recently watched Sea Spiracy. I'm sure a lot of people who will oh, listen to I this eventually have and will do. Um, but I think that, yeah, I think there's something um, to be said for the power of fiction or storytelling as well in kind of normalising um, certain discussions and also going back to our earlier discussion, just really, yeah, using using the power of story to move people (laughs) Mm -hmm. and so that's what we aim to do with this little film and more than anything it's just this story about a little girl trying to save her world one small bit of plastic at a time and so it's kind of our love letter to the sea I suppose yeah that's so beautiful and I think it is a very emotional thing isn't it I mean we are I think as people who are aware of the climate crisis we're we're deeply emotionally involved Mm. So yeah, no, it's it's really great, and I'm I'm very excited, and and that's actually how I sort of stumbled. I mean, obviously we work together as as actors, yeah. but um, yeah, just by chance I I saw that you were doing this, and I thought mm. I was brilliant, and yeah, I wanna I wanna sort of share this with a with a broader audience as well. Yeah, I'm so glad that you reached out about it. I um I'm really like you know moved and happy by how many people have kind of. Um, responded to it already Mm -hmm. and it just I think goes to show that it's you know it's an important subject and hopefully we can do it justice and kind of spark further conversations um, yeah around the subject. Yeah your stories are sort of around children it sparks an emotion reactions a reaction in a lot of adults I think Mm -hmm. but also I mean they are the future you know, they are really at the forefront with Fridays for Future with, with Greta Thunberg. And... But yeah, I think, I mean, it just felt kind of natural to uh, focus these stories around children and through the eyes of children. I think exactly as you say, because they are kind of at the forefront and they're sort of leading this fight in a way. And I mean, you know, we're not that many years older, but <laughs> yeah, they are the future and this is their future. And so obviously... You know, they rightfully so feel very impassioned and angry and scared and, um, yeah, wanting to take action. So it felt it felt only natural to put them front and centre of these stories. And I also think um, that we kind of need to remember how to think about things in the same way that children do sometimes. And mostly I think that comes down to curiosity and asking questions and asking questions of ourselves and others and the world around us yeah so that's kind of I guess that's how it happened (laughs) and I think often children take things more seriously Mm, yeah like it's adults can be so cynical and Mm. and I think really patronizing and and I think adults especially politicians have been quite patronizing about yeah extinction rebellion about the Fridays for Future movement you Mm. know 
so yeah it's it's so important to to take this seriously again and and say no these are mm-hmm. actual concerns yeah and listen to them mm-hmm. listen to the kids listen to their fears you know yeah it's a scary time in this scary world so yeah we should all be working together and supporting each other yeah this this might be a bit of a personal question but have you sort of experienced uh, climate anxiety mm. eco anxiety mm, i don't know i mean i i feel like it's um such a broad term and such a great experience i think i would say that i definitely on like almost a daily basis feel uh, kind of frustrated and a bit on and off hopeless about how much I can do. I think it's the, um, yeah, it's just that I think these conversations can feel so, so overwhelming that as an individual, it really is hard to feel like what you do makes a difference. And I think maybe that falls into climate um, anxiety or eco-anxiety. I'm not entirely sure. But um, yeah, I think it is. it is very difficult to sort of, fight against that feeling sometimes but that's why I love your podcast and I um I've listened to quite a bit of it now but I think what I think is so great about how you kind of frame all of these discussions is that you know no one is going to be the perfect environmentalist and if you're asking someone to be then they'll feel like they can never achieve that so why bother trying Mm -hmm. and I think that's a really yeah I think that's just a really important Thing to remind yourself and everyone of is that like you're not going to be perfect from one day to the next but every single little thing you do is going to help towards the greater picture in some way even if it feels kind of futile in the grand scheme of things but it's not <laughs> and it's yeah. important to remember that it's not but um yeah so a bit of a sort of ramble of an answer I don't know if, if, if you would say that that's climate anxiety (laughs) yeah and I mean you know sometimes it's really difficult to to put a name to it and sometimes Mm. it's also not helpful to to put Mm. a label on it I think whatever it is um, it's in sort of a community that we find hope and that we yeah can just sort of pick each other up and and continue to to move in the right direction and do the right thing yeah completely so at what stage are you with Small Selkie? Um, so we're in pre-production, basically. We mm-hmm. have the sort of core team, the kind of heads of departments. So we have a really, really great team of people. Um, our director, Matilda Harding-Kemp, she is awesome. And she also is just a great environmentalist and like offsets all of her work, which I think is amazing oh, and so yeah. admirable. Yeah. Um, our art director is called Alice Cole Fox. She, she launched a sort of initiative uh, in lockdown one, I think called green art department, which means that she on all of her um, sets, uh, both I think theater and film will work with either natural, mostly natural, and or kind of repurposed and upcycled materials, um, which is amazing. And obviously we'll be um, employing that in this film as well. And our cinematographer, Kia, Kia Fern Little, she um, also is a big environmental advocate and tries to work with only energy efficient equipment. So um, I think we're yeah hopefully kind of geared up with a great team to really make sure as is our goal to make this a a green production and yeah so we're basically uh pre-production and we're in the planning stage organizing stage and we'll also be launching a kickstarter campaign next week um which will run for about 30 days so all of april essentially um and um yeah so hopefully we'll get some support for this film to help get it made and get everyone properly paid and also just make sure that we're not having to cut corners or um, anything when it comes to the environmental side which is obviously very important to this story um yeah and the other thing that i think is hopefully also going to make this film special and um stand out 
amongst the crowd is we're making this a part live action or mostly live action with moments of animation um mm-hmm. and the animation is there as a way to both um sort of highlight um the imagery that we're sharing so it will exaggerate let's say the amount of plastic both because i think seeing is believing to a lot of people so if you can really visually depict what you're saying it it's more memorable and also using animation means that we're not going to have to actually source loads of plastic which would obviously be counterproductive yes um so yeah that's kind of where we're at at the moment and i think it's such a good point because art isn't always the most environmentally friendly i think mm. we've probably all experienced this who are working in the arts um yeah but the thing is we are tuned into it so i think that there are a lot of things that that we probably can do and and be more yeah. sort of aware so yeah that's that's really great yeah and in um in my kind of research around you know green productions environmentally friendly productions it's interesting that it's not it's not um the majority definitely yet but it's definitely a growing trend and there are a couple of examples of films that have um been green <laughs> in some mm-hmm. way or another um and the kind of more on the commercial side but it's interesting to me one of the first things that they'll always sort of give as an example is um that they employed a no plastic water bottle rule and mm-hmm. then they'll always accompany it with the statistic of how much uh plastic and also how much money they saved by doing that which i think is so interesting because i think that often um across the board not just in film now but also you know shopping generally food uh retail everything um we tend to think because often it's true that shopping environmentally friendly and shopping kind of zero waste is more expensive which it can definitely be but with these examples it's often actually cost effective as well mm-hmm. um so just to give you a couple of examples because i do think it's very interesting is um uh let's see so the x-files season 10 apparently um avoided forty five thousand seven hundred and forty plastic bottles across the shoot and that switch from bottles to jugs saved the production thirty five thousand dollars like that's crazy to me insane and there are so many examples kind of similar to that if you just kind of do a little google search but it's just mad and someone did a research kind of um, research around this and estimated that a typical 60 day film shoot for a feature, let's say, uh, can save upwards of $6,000 by just eliminating plastic water bottles. Like just that alone. That is just one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, and then obviously repurposing the materials and donating them to be able to be reused by other shoots or other mm-hmm. productions or whatever. There's so many areas that you can you know save um save in both financially and um, environmentally so it is only logical to me (laughs) yeah absolutely and and i think there's so many areas where we just that people just didn't think about you know they thought like oh well well, we have to have you know individual single use Mm. plastic water bottles and yeah and no you don't and and people i think now are more open to the idea as well so mm-hmm. maybe that is something to give us a bit a little bit of hope that people are just more accepting as well definitely onwards and upwards i think it's yeah it's definitely a positive growing trend so it's just about um really communicating it widely and encouraging people to do the same um yeah but i'm going to be talking to a couple of filmmakers um the next weeks who uh, have a, bit, a film company, sorry, called Fishtown Films, and have made apparently the first zero waste film feature film. So oh. I'm going to be getting some advice and you know tips and tricks and all these sorts of things from them. Um, that's what we're working towards: green production. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's great. No, that that makes me really, really hopeful <laughs> for the future. <laughs> Yeah. Um, great. So let's talk a bit about uh, A Splash of Blue. That's another project mm-hmm. that you're still working on? or No, so that's finished. It's a short animation, um, which 
is not online yet just because I'm submitting it to festivals and some of them are yeah. funny about sharing it um, beforehand so hopefully that will be available soon and when it is I will be sharing it widely but um, yes. it's yeah it's a short animation film about again a young girl um, who lives in a sort of more urban setting and um, her whole life she has known the sky to be a sort of murky greeny brown and for there to be no real wildlife and um, plant life around uh, until one day a neighbour moves in next door to her and she notices that above the neighbour's garden the sky is blue there's a patch of blue in the sky and so she wants that it's beautiful and she's mesmerised by it and she wants to have that and so um, she sort of gets it a bit wrong <laughs> the first time round and paints herself a sky that is blue and paints herself uh, luscious green trees and bees and flowers until the rain comes along and it washes it all away and her efforts have been rendered useless um, and only when she really really looks and learns does she see that in fact her neighbour is planting and tending to lots of seeds and that's what's making the trees grow and that's what's making the skies become blue again and so with the help of her neighbour this elderly woman um, she goes out into her community and you know encourages all of her neighbours to do the same until all of the sky is blue again so it's a bit of a um, I suppose more light-hearted <laughs> and very kind of metaphorical depiction of it but I think and I hope that it still brings across the message that um, we need to be more conscious in how we live and we need to get back in touch with the nature around us and also that it's important to work as a community and work uh, in a collective to really make a big difference. Yes, uh, it sounds absolutely beautiful, magical and, and I've seen some of the, the animation on, on your website mm. and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really keen to, to see it so definitely look out for it. Yeah, Once I'll it's let you know the, when it's yeah. been released. <laughs> yeah, and we'll definitely share it. Awesome. Now that that's great, and I think again, art can be so so powerful, mm-hmm. and and we need just more of it. I think we need need all all hands on deck to yes. sort of get people on board, and and I mean that is sort of what we're trying trying to do as well, and but to do it in a light hearted way. I mean, I think mm-hmm. you know obviously what like what Greta is doing for example is, is so admirable and 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 it's it's fantastic and I think she is actually quite light-hearted as well and on mm. Twitter and on her social media yeah. and stuff and but she is very serious as well and I think we need yeah. both mm-hmm. um and it it really enrages me how people ridicule her and but she's mm. really really strong as well in responding yeah. to those people so okay. there's a kind of resilience as well that I I really admire. Yeah, no, definitely. She's amazing. And just the whole movement that she's sort of um, enacted and sparked is remarkable. (laughs) What would you say to actually someone who is maybe like a climate change sceptic or maybe acknowledges that that it exists, but but they feel like, oh, well, it's it's too big of an issue? Mm. Yeah, I mean... I've met some (laughs) and truthfully I found it very difficult to talk to them because there's just so much resistance and Mm -hmm. defensiveness and kind of a sense that they've made up their mind you know Um, and that can become quite demoralizing and frustrating when you feel you can't communicate what you know to be true Um, and of course facts and statistics are important but it's clear that often people don't want to hear these or kind of what I was saying earlier that they can't even begin to comprehend what it actually means um you know I as well I also find it for example difficult to understand uh what it means when someone tells me that the great pacific garbage patch is uh, like 1.5 1.6 million square kilometers until it's compared to the size of France Germany and Spain combined or the size of um twice the size of Texas and three times the size of France or whatever um kind of comparison is made then I understand that that is obscene but I think often numbers on their own and statistics 
don't mean that much to people mm-hmm. at a certain point. It's that kind of desensitization thing that I think comes in there. And yeah, I think our brain just kind of struggles to compute that sometimes until we directly relate it to something else. Yeah. Um, and that's again where I'll just always come back to the fact that I think storytelling holds great power. So I would tell someone to, you know, I'd show them the images, I'd ask them to watch the films, I'd ask them to read the books and really engage with the discussion on maybe more of a tangible level. I think that's the thing. It just feels so intangible a lot of the time. And so Mm. it's about finding those ways to make it feel more real and that something that you can connect to, you know? Absolutely. And I think, I mean, we can all feel it. If we're, if we're really honest, I think Mm. we can feel it in the weather. We can feel Mm. it in how extreme everything has become like all the the floods in the UK and stuff and I mean that is that is partially climate change it's also people building in the wrong places Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I think we need to we need more people to wake up to this and say okay look go out experience the world you live in and and see the connection it is there yeah yeah and I think it's also um it's kind of asking people to engage with something even when they say I don't know I know it's going to upset me or I know that you know there's nothing I can do anyways it's sort of it's coming back to that um point of just trying to instill hope (laughs) as Uh much as possible um because otherwise it can start to feel very doom and gloom which it is um but yeah basically do what you said (laughs) yeah and and we just need to continue you know I mean even though it it looks so bad but what what is the alternative to just you know like give up yeah that's just not exactly exactly in your personal life what I mean you know what this is the green pretenders (laughs) Mm -hmm. we said earlier we're when (laughs) by far not the the perfect environmentalists Mm -hmm. we're very flawed um and you know, but we're trying to to be better at things. What is yeah. your Achilles heel? <laughs> My Achilles heel is unfortunately cheese. I mm-hmm. would say I find it very hard to not eat cheese sometimes, um, and I know that that's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you can give me a really great vegan cheese. I would appreciate I it. <laughs> I know. It's just not quite there yet. I no. really, I honestly hope that they keep at it and somehow magically, yeah, it will get better. Yeah. But have you sort of changed your behavior around cheese? I mean, has it become more of a cheese cheese for a treat? <laughs> or um, <laughs> it's not quite meat for a treat, but um, or, or th- where you source your cheese? Is that? Have you changed? Yeah, I mean, definitely that? just in general, anything animal product based is like very, very, very much in moderation. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's just the way that all kind of sustainable living should be um, approached. That, you know, if everybody just consumed less and if everybody, yeah, it was just less kind mm-hmm. of wasteful and greedy, <laughs> then. Yeah it would just do the world of good so I think everything everything in moderation and yeah I think definitely treat it as a treat treat it as a treat (laughs) treat um but yeah moderation is the key and I think just also like you say um kind of inquiring a little bit more deeply about where something comes from and also where you choose to uh purchase whatever it is from yeah just thinking about it a little bit more and asking questions yeah and giving it real value like Mm. if it is something special if it's it's a real like a luxury you'll just enjoy it so much more and and the fewer you eat it the more you'll actually enjoy it yes so yeah Yeah. and I mean it has it is difficult for me as well and I know for Sean as well Mm. and we have yeah we have our little things and even I kind of experienced this beginning of this year I got mm. a little bit worse in my habits and mm. and you know I, I I was really good at some point with like not buying anything in plastic and then yeah. every now and then you just 
it, you find it so difficult that you sort of revert back to, oh, well, you know, there is, if, I wish they would just not wrap it in plastic. And yeah. that is true. But yeah, in, yeah, I think we, we need to hold our, ourselves accountable and each other yeah. accountable a little bit Definitely. without being, you know, like waving the finger, but. Yeah, Definitely. but just kind of challenging each other sometimes and just asking, you know, is there really no other way or am I just doing this because I'm lazy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, but no, I mean, I think um, I think we all, well, I don't want to speak on behalf of everyone, but I think a lot of people did at the beginning of uh, the whole COVID-19 outbreak, there was a lot of fear around, um, you know, food contamination as well and things like that Mm -hmm. so i think that's why a lot of people then reached for the plastic items again because it felt somehow um safer yeah (laughs) and like it was protected which i mean is ridiculous as well but yeah so yeah and i think they found even that on plastic surfaces the virus stays longer than yeah Mm. so but it it is about information and it's about knowledge and that's why we need to to keep the conversation going and really talk about it yeah exactly yeah so you've listened to a few episodes so you know mm-hmm. about the concept of eco whoop and eco poop yes i do <laughs> <laughs> maybe i should explain for listeners who who just <laughs> tap into that episode um so an eco whoop is something environmentally friendly that has that you've encountered it could be a thing an, an app or whatever you know a concept or or a tangible product and an eco poop is obviously the opposite, so something that is terrible for the environment and that you've come to to be aware of. Um, so, what is your eco whoop for this episode? So, my eco whoop um, is that I now shop at our local package free shop, and it is amazing, and I love it. Um, and you can get everything there, and I save all of my jars, and it just feels. It's kind of going back to what you were saying earlier. It just makes it feel more valuable and more um, special somehow. Yeah. Um, and and it also just means that you're not, um, I don't know, you're just consuming more consciously. So I've been very excited about that and that it's just a walk away, which is amazing. Uh, and we also have lots of lovely kind of local fruit and veg shops um, around where everything is unpackaged. So that's been uh how i have done my shopping lately <clears throat> and i love it um and yeah <laughs> yeah that's brilliant where is that shop what's it called um it is called by gram so b y g r a m um mm-hmm. i think there's a few around this one is in um fulham but i think there's also one in clapham and i think a couple of others around but i'd have to check exactly yeah where um great. By, by, but, by the gram yeah, it's, it's great because it just yeah exactly exactly and you weigh your uh containers and then fill up with your stuff <laughs> that's great that's a great eco whoop um mm. and what's the poop for this <laughs> poop. um just because i thought i'd make this nice and relevant to what i've been talking about um i would say my biggest eco poop of recent weeks and months is um previous film productions that I've worked on that have shot during COVID that have not been very green and have created a lot of plastic waste, uh, be that PPE, but also individually packaged meals, individually wrapped snacks and crisps and chocolates and things like this. Um, And uh, it was all kind of for the sake of ease, for the sake of... um, ticking it off the risk assessment and the COVID assessment. But ultimately, um, I've learned that it's not necessary to go that way and that it's possible to be, you know, hygienic without creating all of the waste. So definitely a great learning experience, um, but a big, big poop. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that is a big one. And, mm. and, I re- as, and I think as someone who is... Who, who is just aware of these kind of things it really hurts it hurts mm. it really hurts me when there's yeah. loads of plastic and i yeah. kind of feel like oh this is not necessary yeah <laughs> but yeah. yeah 
So, I mean, we live and we learn and we do better. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And you're trying to do things differently. And and I think, yeah, yeah, that's really great. So where can people find you? Uh, People can find me personally on Instagram and Twitter as at Nina Georgia. Uh, And on my website, which is just www.ninagiorgia.com. And they can also find uh, the film and all updates and announcements and bits about the film on at small selkie film everywhere. So Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Brilliant. That's great. Yeah. Make sure to, to link that and check it out. Thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. It's Thank been a real so. pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's really been really nice lovely. It's my first time on a podcast as well, so I was very excited this morning. Oh, very nice. I know. <laughs> <We're> happy. <laughs> happy that you, yeah, that you enjoyed it and had a good time. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, yeah, I look forward to, you know, talking more about all of these things in the future. Yes, absolutely. We'll keep the conversation going. Yeah. Pico snaps for Nina. That was Woo. the year. Well, Simon, what was it like talking to a fellow creative in the world of sustainability? It was such a lovely conversation. Nina was so easy to talk to and you heard it in the interview. I actually thought it was it's so nice because it's it's like us. Like (laughs) she is truly an honorary green pretender because as performers, I think often, yeah, as I said, we feel we feel like maybe we have less to say than, say, a scientist or something. So it was really nice to to chat to her yeah what a perfect first guest for this uh for this slightly new way of doing things that we're we're trying out um what a legend and just because we're doing a new series doesn't mean we're changing everything because we know we love our eco whoops and eco poops and they aren't going anywhere no they're not um shall we start with the negatives first yeah yeah let's eco poop Simon, hit me. Right, I'm going to hit you with my first eco poop of series two. And you know what? I'm new and improved, just like our podcast is. And I'm going to try to make, to turn it into an eco whoop every time. See if, see if, if that works out. Um, I love it. My first eco poop is old sunscreen. So I actually read that uh, after a year, the chemicals in sunscreen actually turn toxic. So you should throw out your old sunscreen every year which okay so there's a myriad of poops in there first of all (laughs) a lot of sunscreen is actually (laughs) not literally (laughs) it's a bottle of shit everybody you're you're smearing a myriad of poos on your skin (laughs) yeah you got me there um pretty much is because well (laughs) (laughs) oh no and we was, we've been sounding so professional. I think we really tried to get this series going with a new professional tone. But don't worry, if you're listening, we're still just talking about poo. <laughs> yes, we are. So, okay. So, but in all seriousness, uh, sunscreen is, uh, I think, pretty bad for the oceans, for example. So if you put, like, sunscreen on and then you jump into the sea, there's often this film of, or in the lake, maybe you can see it more clearly. It's like, like a layer, like after an oil spill. So, mm. you know, that's not good. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it, it, it's actually toxic after a year. So you also have to change your sunscreen all the time. And then, you know, what, what are you going to do with all that leftover toxic sunscreen? Are you just going to throw it in the bin? You know, I haven't, I don't have a solution to that yet as, you know, we're working things out, but I will from now on always grab a smaller bottle of sunscreen even maybe though economically it doesn't make sense and i also try to go for maybe a vegan one or an environmentally friendly one even though they are quite like paint so you're basically painting yourself white but also i read in that article what's wrong with just going into the shade like wearing a thin layer so actually you're not exposing your skin to the sun and you know i was like an an avid tanner I love my tan, get the tan on, look healthy, but it's actually just burning your skin. So, 
you know, we'll see. Hold me accountable to that. And as as always with things, when it comes to sustainability, I'm immediately thinking, but a smaller bottle means more plastic waste because like we're, yeah. we're taught buying things in bulk is better. It's just such a minefield, isn't it? It's but such a minefield. As someone it's who nightmare. burns like crazy, I don't think I'd ever be able to forego sunscreen altogether. But mm. I agree, yeah, just forking out on the posher brands I, sunscreen's so expensive anyway but mm-hmm. i think one year i bought something called la roche pose or something and it was very expensive but it was all claimed to be anyway all natural and it was came in a much smaller classy little bottle so i did actually get through it in one summer so maybe it's just something we've got to vote with our wallets and 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 fork out for yes my eco poop is the fact that the government has decided to authorize use of a bee killing pesticide um and this is something that's almost a direct result of brexit so it's a bit of a shame we're seeing how without eu regulations we're already in this country making decisions that are quite sad um so yeah that's just quite a big one it's it's sad and I think this is one of those things, if you speak to a lot of farmers, they'll say that this is really necessary for them, these pesticides that they haven't been able to use because of EU red tape, etc., um, has made it so much harder for them to maintain certain crops. So now they are being authorised to use this pesticide, but the offshot is that it will. there's going to be a lot of bees killed. And obviously we need the bees and we love the bees and the bees are very important. <laughs> So that's my eco poop. I don't have any solution, obviously, um, because I am not the prime minister. But as with everything, there are petitions to be signed and letters to be written if you feel like you want to raise your voice against that. And you can also buy these little um, bee saving kits so that even though, unfortunately, we can't stop, you know, like the massacre of lots of bees, we can do our little snowflake effort and maybe have a little bee saving kit on us which will just be a little vial of a sort of nectar thing that we can save a little bee on the street if we ever see it um struggling um so yes we can we can do something in response to this news despite the fact that we can't stop it and so it is my eco poop the bee killing pesticides yes oh my god what a big food i love the bees and farmers should love the bees as well because once the bees are gone humans are gone that's a fact it's such an interesting thing to me. This is like a whole other episode. We And we do want to talk about agriculture in more detail at some point. But I find it so interesting that farmers are often, I'd, you know, expect maybe in my mind, thinking of these rolling hills and a farmer who's just so in touch with nature. But ultimately, it's their livelihood. And there will be decisions that, that they need to make that aren't necessarily with, you know, animal welfare or certain things that we consider climate friendly in mind because it's their job and I completely empathize with that I get it but it's just sometimes jarring for me like to hear farmers actively say well no we need to use these pesticides and in my head I'm like but you're a farmer don't you love the bees anyway eco whoop eco whoop so my eco whoop this week is that I actually took some shoes that I had and you're gonna love this jam um they they were hand-me-downs Lovely leather Chelsea boots. And, you know, even though I I would try not to buy new leather, like, if it's already there, use it. And they had ripped at the seam. And mm. I was very sad because they're lovely and they fit me well. And I already had the soles replaced. So on a whim, I took them to... I wanted to take them to my favourite shoe repairing shop. But I'm not sure if that is operating anymore, which is very sad. Anyway, I took it to... A dry cleaners where it said you know like mending service or whatever and I left it there and then they talked to the shoe guy and the shoe guy said yeah sure I can fix that and it was 15 quid which is cheaper than a new pair I saved an old pair going to landfill and also I supported a local business so I think that is yes. so Whoop! I'm smiling so widely right now because I'm just imagining some pair of shoes sat on the shelf in H and M or something that you might have, like another person would have just gone and replaced them. But no, you don't need to do that. No. That's gorge. I can't wait to see them on you. Yeah, and also, you know, it, I think we need to change, and that's why I wanted to mention it because I think we need to change people's perception and the, their way of thinking a little bit. You know, like if if some a pair of jeans rips. 
then you're like, ah, oh, okay, reason to check them out. No, you could also mend them. It depends, obviously, you know, I'm not saying like wear things until they literally fall off you. But, you know, d just because something is ripped, don't always discard it immediately. We can, we can fix a lot more than we think. Yeah. And if anyone's listening who lives near me or knows me well, I love fixing things or at least attempting to. So if you've got an old piece of clothing and you don't know what to do with it, I would happily give it a go for you because I just really enjoy it. Moving on, my eco woo is Oddbox, which Ooh. is a delivery service of, um, you can get it weekly or fortnightly. Probably lots of people have heard of this already. They're, you know, pretty big now, but I'm shouting out to them anyway. Um, it's across London and the Southeast. Um, it's a weekly or fortnightly delivery of fruit and veg. And it's like the stuff that was rejected from um, supermarkets or like mass wholesalers. I don't know the production line. But basically, you get your big box. None of it's packaged. It's just all beautifully chucked in there with a list of reasons why these things were rejected. So there's like a mound of potatoes and it will say, potatoes, too many. So the potatoes were over, there were too many potato surplus and they would have just been thrown out otherwise. Um, the other day we had some broccoli that was too purple for commercial sale. We had some apples that had been hailed on when they were little baby apples in the orchard. So they had like speckly skin and they were rejected from. So it's just a whole myriad, we're going back to that word, myriad reasons. And I love it on all levels because there's, yeah, it, it lessens your packaging, it prevents food waste, and it makes you more imaginative in the kitchen because you look at what's in front of you, you don't get to choose what you get, it's something different every week, and so you just have to think, how do I cook this? Um, we got a celeriac the other week, which we'd never had before, and Dave, my other half, made like a really cool roasted celeriac steak vibe so yeah odd box if you live in london or the southeast i think it's a win-win-win-win situation economically sustainably and taste tastily food tasty tastily yes that's a, yeah that's i i've looked at or i get their ads on instagram but I've, I've never actually checked it out so maybe i should really give that a go and do they get do they tell you the little story of the apple and the broccoli and yeah yeah so there's a sheet of paper in each box which lists everything that you've got in that week's box it lists some recipe ideas so you you even get a bit of inspiration of how you might use those veggies or fruit and then it lists the reason that this particular crop or batch of that has ended up in this box so yeah whether it's surplus hailed on the wrong colour, the wrong shape, too big, too small. All of the reasons that we've decided cosmetically that fruit and veg aren't up to scratch when actually they're perfectly good for eating. Um, so it's really cool to kind of, you even get a little story behind it. Yeah, that's really cool. I love that. Nice. Well, we have talked each other's ears off and now we want to hear from you. So if you want to get in touch with us, you can find us on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at Green Pretenders. Um, or if you want to email us, if you maybe know someone who would like to come on the podcast or if you'd like to yourself um, or just to get in touch, you can email us thegreenpretenders at gmail.com. And if you want to get in touch with our guest, Nina, you can also on social media find her at Nina Georgia. Or if you want to know more about her film, Small Selkie, it's at Small Selkie with a K, S E L K I E, film on Instagram. And I want to take this opportunity to mention that Nina has actually a, a Kickstarter going on for her film, which is going into production. And if you want to contribute, please do so. There's a Kickstarter campaign. And I'm definitely going to support her. Me too. And we'll share that campaign on our social medias as well. So um, we'll remind you of it down the line. Yes. Cool. That's it for this week. And there's only one thing to remember. The, the pod is, is always, always greener. greener.